Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to see I'm not like the bishop who turned up at a country church in England. And as he mounted the pulpit, he noticed there were only three elderly people in the audience. And he said to the vicar, he said, uh, did you tell them I was coming? And the vicar said, no, but word seems to have got around. <laughs> Now, I am particularly delighted to be in the University of Harvard because I studied at Emmanuel College, Cambridge, the other Cambridge. <laughs> and in that college, there is a very special room which has been preserved for several hundred years. It was occupied by John Harvard because your great John Harvard came from Emmanuel College. And one of the things that was my joy during my time at Cambridge was to get to know a succession of very distinguished Harvard scholars because there probably still is a system where you can spend a term or a year in Cambridge at Emmanuel and you enjoy his huge suite of rooms and a very extensive entertainment allowance. <laughs> so I'm particularly delighted to be here. I'm interested to see that the motto of your university is the word that stands behind me tonight, veritas, which indicates that the founders were interested in truth. Of course, all of us must start somewhere. And I started in the small country of Northern Ireland. My parents were Christian, but they were not sectarian, and they gave me the greatest gift that a parent can give to his child. They allowed me to think. But when I arrived in Cambridge, in my first week as a student, someone said to me, do you believe in God? And then they said, oh, sorry, I forgot you're Irish. <laughs> All you people believe in God and you fight about it. <laughs> that was a turning point in my life. Because I was interested in truth. Could it be that my faith in God was simply a product of Irish genetics? <laughs> and so on that day I decided to get to know people that did not share my worldview and befriend them. And I have been doing it ever since. I have spent a lot of time in Eastern Europe, in the communist time during the Cold War, and more laterally, because I speak Russian, spending time in Russia discussing these things in the academies of science. And one of the questions that keeps cropping up is the question that you've invited me to talk about tonight. Miracles is belief in the supernatural irrational. Now there are several concepts here, and the major one of course is the word miracle, which comes from the Latin miraculum, something wondered at. Now of course I'm aware it has a weaker meaning, like it was a miracle that she passed her exams at Harvard, <laughs> since she never seemed to do any work. You will be mistaken if you think that is the topic I'm going to address this evening. <laughs> the Oxford English Dictionary describes a miracle as a marvelous event occurring within human experience which cannot have been brought about by human power or by the operation of any natural agency and must therefore be ascribed to the special intervention of the deity or some supernatural being. Now, of course, if there is no such thing as a supernatural being or supernature, there is no need to discuss miracle, and they're not quite the same thing. 
So the antecedent question that we need to discuss is, first of all, is there a supernature? Or is nature that we observe all that exists? In other words, we have to face the question of the existence of God. Now, if you've been following the British newspapers, as I hope you do every day, of course, <laughs> you will discover that Richard Dawkins is all over the front pages all this week, militantly proclaiming that atheism is essentially the default position. He, as the acknowledged leader of the new atheists, is determined to show that science has rendered belief in all supernatural gods impossible. His book, The God Delusion, is directed explicitly against the concept of the supernatural. And he wishes to use science to abolish religion. Now, of course, not all atheists are extreme as Dawkins. Jürgen Habermas, a leading German intellectual who's an atheist, regards religion as an important source for creating meaning. And indeed, he warns Europe that our educational system, our legal system, our human rights are all derivative from the Judeo-Christian tradition. And interestingly, he, as a leading intellectual atheist on the continent, adds, to this day we have no other source. Everything else is post-modern chatter. That's a fascinating statement for an intellectual atheist. And I was reminded of that origin of our educational institutions as I looked up at your magnificent philosophy building. It's the only one in the world I've ever seen to bear the inscription, what is man that you are mindful of him? Ladies and gentlemen, students of Harvard, you stand in a tradition that at its inception saw no contradiction between the highest intellectual aspirations and belief in God even in the philosophy department. <laughs> I don't know what it's like now. <laughs> but certainly, they did not believe then that belief in God was an insult to the intellect. Now, the new atheists are determined to spread the myth that science and belief in God are incompatible. I say myth because it's very easy to see that that is far too simplistic an analysis. How can science and belief in God be essentially incompatible when, for instance, so many leading scientists at my own University of Oxford believe in God? I can name the heads of several scientific departments, world famous in their fields, nanotechnology, electrical engineering, and so on, who are believers in God. And in this country, just to name one, William Phillips, Nobel Prize winner for physics, is a believer in God. And what I simply observe is this, that brilliant science can be done by atheists, and brilliant science can be done by believers in God, which shows us, ladies and gentlemen, that the conflict which is real lies much deeper in. It is not simplistically between science and belief in God and the supernatural. It is between two worldviews, two concepts of the nature of ultimate reality. And it is against that background that I wish to make my remarks. The one worldview is naturalism or materialism, there's very little difference between them, which believes that this universe is all that exists, or the multiverse. And that has implications for the nature of explanation. It means that explanation, by definition, must be reductionist from the bottom up, because there is no transcendence, there is no ultimate top-down causation. That was the view of Democritus and Leucippus in the ancient world. But also in that Greek uh, melting pot, there were philosophers like Socrates and, and Plato and Aristotle, and they did not accept that view. They believed there was transcendence, there was something more. And those two views come barreling up through history, and they divide us in this room tonight. And they divide the professors in the academy, both in Oxford and in Cambridge, in England, 
and in Massachusetts. So what we're talking about, ladies and gentlemen, is worldviews, belief systems, each of them. The one is naturalism and the other is theism. And it's just here that we encounter the first confusion. When I debated Princeton professor Peter Singer in Australia recently, he started by saying to us that his chief objection to religious belief was that people remained in the faith in which they'd been brought up. And of course, I was a prime example. So just to redress the balance, I asked him publicly about his parents. I said, Peter, were your parents atheists? And he said, yes, they were. <laughs> so I said, um, you remained in the faith in which you were brought up then. Oh, but he said, it isn't a faith. Oh, I said, I was under the impression you believed it. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, that little spat, and I got on very well with Peter Singer, you can watch the debate online, is very revealing because it's consistent with the attitude of the new atheist to regard religious faith as faith, and therefore, by definition, believing where there is no evidence. But atheism isn't a faith. And of course, any philosopher could point out to them how trivial that is. It is very important to see that we are dealing with two belief systems. One believes that this universe is the ultimate reality, mass energy. The other believes that God is the ultimate reality. And the burning question is, what evidence is there for the very task of either of them? The truth of either of them? And in particular, what way does science point? And therefore, we need to be clear that the kind of faith that the new atheists are describing is what most of us would call blind faith. It's dangerous, of course. But faith, in its ordinary dictionary sense, derives from the word fides. It means trust. And all of us know that we don't usually trust people unless we're gullible, unless there's evidence to do so. We don't trust the banks either unless there's evidence to do so, but that's another story. <laughs> But the banking crisis has at least taught all of us the difference between evidence-based faith and non-evidence-based faith. And now, I cannot, of course, speak for other religions. They must rightly speak for themselves. But I'd like to make it very clear that Christianity is an evidence-based faith. One of the central statements of the Gospel of John is, these things are written, he said, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. In other words, here's the evidence. I've selected it in order for it to provide a basis for your trust, for your confidence, for your faith. I'll come back to the matter of faith later. But having uh, talked briefly about that, I want to address this question quite rapidly. What way does science point? I claim that science points towards God. The atheists claim it points in the opposite direction. And I want to bring as witnesses, first of all, history. It is no accident that when Harvard was founded, belief in God was written into its motto and onto its philosophy building. Because historians of science, like my colleague at Oxford, my former colleague John Hedley Brook, usually, most of them, will agree with what's called Merton's thesis. And the best formulation of it, I think, is due to C.S. Lewis, who said that men became scientific. Why? Because they expected law in nature, and they expected law in nature because they believed in a lawgiver. And the great pioneers of science, Galileo, Kepler, Newton, Clark Maxwell, Babbage, and so on, were all believers in God. I can remember I had the opportunity to give the very first lecture on this topic in Novosibirsk in Siberia. Quite a few members of the KGB in front of me. <laughs> and um, I was invited by the provost, I think that's what you call them over here, 
I was invited by him to give a lecture on why a mathematician believes in God. It was the very first lecture on that topic in the university in 75 years. And uh, when I started talking about the history of science and the fact that Newton and Galileo were believers, I noticed anger rising in the front row of heavyweight professors. So I stopped. And I said, what's the matter? And they said, why were we never told this? <laughs> and I said, can't you guess? <laughs> They'd never been told. It was totally new to them that the founders of science were believers in God. Now you laugh, but actually we need to think carefully about the implications of that. Because the one thing it demonstrates is that belief in God and supernature were not at the beginning incompatible with uh, science in the slightest degree. It was exactly the opposite. So what has happened? Why is it that I'm even having to give a lecture on this topic in Harvard. Why isn't it that we do still believe that there's something more than the natural world? If there is such a deep-seated harmony between science and belief in God? Well, first of all, there is a confusion about the reach of science. Alex Rosenberg, in his book, The Atheist Guide to Reality, says, the mistake is to think that there is any more to reality than the laws of nature that science discovers. Scientism, in other words, is the reigning view. The idea that science is the only way to truth. Now we're immediately into the realms of epistemology. And Bertrand Russell summarized this viewpoint by saying, what science cannot tell us, mankind cannot know. Now, Russell was quite a brilliant logician, but his logic failed him badly when he, he made that statement. What science cannot tell us, mankind cannot know. Is that a statement of science? No, so that we cannot know it. <laughs> is it too late for logic? <laughs> this is what we call a logically incoherent statement. If it's true, it's false. You could work it out afterwards. <laughs> Far more sensible is the view of Nobel Prize winner Sir Peter Medawar, who said it's so easy to see the limits of science. It cannot answer the questions of a child. Where am I coming from? What is the meaning of life? Where am I going to? We need to go outside science. So point number one, major point number one, ladies and gentlemen, is science does not define the limit of rationality. Rationality is bigger than science. Einstein, of course, saw it clearly. He said you can speak of the ethical foundations of science, but you cannot speak of the scientific foundations of ethics. He saw that there was a realm into which science couldn't go. And of course, that's obvious in Harvard, isn't it? I do believe you still have some humanities faculties left, don't you? <laughs> because if science was the only way to truth, you'd have to shut them tomorrow. And I don't think you'd want to do that, and neither would I. This scientism is extremely limited. The second thing is a confusion about the nature of explanation. I'm talking about God, ladies and gentlemen, but I wanted to be very clear to you what I mean by God. Because it seems to me that a great deal of atheist confusion today is that their concept of God is not one that I would share for a moment. Their idea of God is a God of the gaps. Again, in Novosibirsk, I remember I was severely attacked, I tend to be severely attacked, uh, <laughs> by a professor. He said, he came up to the blackboard and he drew a stroke of lightning. And he said, this is absurd what we're listening to. You see, the ancients used to believe that the gods were behind this. And then we did a bit of atmospheric physics, and we found it wasn't the gods. Exit space for God. And that's the concept of the god of the gaps. I can't explain it, therefore God did it. Bit more science, a bit less space for God. Now, if you believe in a god like that, it's clear that you've got to make a choice between God and science. Because the science increases by definition, God decreases. But what if you don't believe in a god like that? I certainly don't. My God is not a God of the gaps, he's the God of the whole show. 
So that when Isaac Newton discovered his law of gravitation, he didn't say, wonderful, I've now got a law and a mathematical description of how it works, I don't need God. He didn't do that. What he did was write the most brilliant book in the history of science, the Principia Mathematica, expressing the hope that it would persuade the thinking person to believe in God. In other words, the more he understood of science, the more he admired the genius of the God who did it that way. The God was not a God of the gaps. Because you see, ladies and gentlemen, God is not the same kind of explanation as science is. Stephen Hawking, in a recent book to which I've responded in my little book, God and Stephen Hawking, <laughs> say that was a quick plug, wasn't it, eh? <laughs> Stephen Hawking says we've got to choose between God and gravity. Well, if I were to have a, you know what a Ford Galaxy motor car is, don't you, or automobile? Um, <laughs> If I had one of those here and I said, look, I want to offer you two explanations for it. The one is the law of internal combustion and mechanical engineering, a law mechanism explanation. The other is Henry Ford, please choose. <laughs> well, you'd say, you're absurd. You need both, do you? Now this is extremely important to realize that explanation comes in different kinds. If you want a complete explanation of the Ford Galaxy, you have to have a law mechanism explanation, the scientific one, and you have to have an agent explanation in terms of Henry Ford. Please notice they don't contradict each other. And the idea is going around, spread virulently by one of the Dawkins memes, the idea is going around that you must have either or. That's nonsense. The existence, and I'm wording this very carefully, the existence of a mechanism that does something is not in itself an argument for the non-existence of an agent who designed it. So that we don't see science. I don't see science. I'm a passionate scientist, if you count pure mathematics as science, but that's another matter. <laughs> um, I'm a passionate scientist. We don't see a competition going on here at all because God is not a God of the gap. So the more I study, the more I'm impressed with the genius of God. We must not assume that there's only one level of explanation. Now, to move on a little bit, I mentioned faith. And it has been put about that faith is A, a religious concept, and B, it means believing where there's no evidence. Both of those definitions are seriously false. I've argued for the second, now let's come to the first. What about the use of faith in science? It is vastly important, of course. Einstein saw it. And so did Eugene Wigner, who wrote a wonderful paper, much loved to mathematicians, in 1961, entitled The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics. I mean, how is it that this bright Harvard mathematician, thinking in her mind in here, comes up with equations that describe the universe out there? How does that work? And it led Einstein to say the only incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible. Now, we do science with our mind. And what I want you to think about now is not the philosophy of science, but the fact that we can do it. Because to me, one of the greatest evidence is that nature is not all that exists, is the fact that we can do science. And let me try and proceed with the argument. It starts with Darwin and something he wrote. Let me read it to you. With me, the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of lower animals, are of any value or are at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind if there are any convictions in such a mind? Now, that particular statement is being subjected at the moment to an immense amount of philosophical analysis in the light 
of the way in which science is going. Because you see, many people hold that the driving force of the natural processes that eventually produced our human cognitive faculties were not primarily concerned with truth at all, but with survival. And we all know what has generally happened and still happens to truth when individuals or commercial enterprises or nations, motivated by what Dawkins calls their selfish genes, feel themselves threatened in the struggle for survival. They are essentially obliged to regard thought as some kind of neurophysiological phenomenon. Now, from the evolutionary perspective, the neurophysiology might, of course, well be adaptive. But why for one moment would one think that beliefs caused by the neurophysiology should be mostly true? After all, as the chemist Haldane pointed out long ago, if the thoughts in my mind are just the motions of atoms in my brain, a mechanism that has arisen by mindless, unguided processes, why should I believe anything it tells me, including the fact that it's made of atoms? <laughs> now, this is, to my mind, very important indeed. One of America's leading philosophers, Alvin Plantinga, puts it this way. If Dawkins is right, and we are the product of mindless, unguided natural processes, then he has given us strong reason to doubt the reliability of human cognitive faculties, and therefore inevitably to doubt the validity of any belief that they produce, including Dawkins' own science and his atheism. His biology and his belief in naturalism would therefore appear to be at war with each other in a conflict that has nothing to do with God. I find that fascinating. In other words, I'm suggesting to you, ladies and gentlemen, that it's not irrational to believe in supernature. It is irrational to believe solely in nature. The boot is entirely on the other foot. Atheistic reductionism undermines the foundations of the very nature of the rationality needed to construct its arguments, or any argument of any kind whatsoever. And I think that the new atheists have signally failed to appreciate the catastrophic implications of their view for science. A very interesting sidelight is thrown uh, on this by Nietzsche. Listen to this. Only if we assume a God, this is Nietzsche, only if we assume a God who is morally our like can truth and the search for truth be at all something meaningful and promising of success. This God left aside, the question is permitted whether being deceived is not one of the conditions of life. So, ladies and gentlemen, my basic argument tonight is this. It is a scientific argument in that sense. I believe science makes sense as something we can do. And for that reason, I reject a naturalism that undermines the foundations of the rationality I need to do my science. On the other hand, biblical theism, which I espouse, is completely coherent in its explanation why the universe is rationally intelligible because it teaches me that the universe out there and the mind in here are ultimately traceable to the same intelligent God. Naturalism, I submit, is incapable of explaining itself. So that rational explanation has a legitimate claim to universality, but natural explanation does not. And ironically, Particularly recent science suggests that naturalism is doomed because it teaches that the universe is a causally closed system by definition. This means, of course, that everything can be explained reductionalistically in terms of physical and chemical processes. But the naturalists who insist on explaining everything in terms of such processes cannot explain their own scientific theories or mathematical equations in terms of mere physical or chemical processes for the simple reason that theories, laws, and equations are not physical. They are immaterial. And the odd irony of all of this is 
You and I live in the information age. And we've discovered, and the physicists are telling us, that information is essentially a fundamental quantity that is not reducible to physics and chemistry. So the irony of naturalism is that we're now in an age where we've got to believe in something that's non-material. It is supernatural in the strict meaning of the term. So it's a very interesting intellectual situation to be in, ladies and gentlemen. And I want to suggest that the very existence of rationality is an outpost, so to speak, of the image of God that opens up the conceptual space to seeing that limiting ourselves to a naturalistic explanation is destroying the possibility of all explanation together. And, you know, that question of the immateriality of information is very important. It means we cannot reduce information to physics and chemistry. Let me tell you a little story. We have a marvelous college in Oxford. I'm a fellow of Green Templeton College, and we put on lovely dinners. And uh, unfortunately, sometimes the seat arrangements are fixed, so you can't adjust where you're sitting. So this night, I was sitting beside a biochemist, and he asked me what I did, and I was foolish enough to reply. I said, I'm a pure mathematician. Oh, he said, how dreadfully boring. And um, I said, oh, but, but, but I tried to make up for it by being interested in the big questions of life. He said, like what? Well, I said, like the status of the universe. Is it created or not? Oh, dear, he said, it's far worse than I thought. <laughs> he said, listen, the bottom line is this. I'm an atheist. I'm a reductionist. We're going to have an awful evening. We've nothing to talk about. And that's that. So what do you do with that? Well, I said to him, I said, you know, it's not all that bad, is it? I said, I mean, I'm fascinated by reductionism. I know at least three kinds. Which kind are you? Well, he wasn't quite sure. So uh, <laughs> being a kind man, I helped him a little bit. And I said, uh, you're a methodological reductionist. You take a big problem, split it into little problems, solve the little problems, get insight onto the big problem. Yes, he said, I do that. Good, I said. We agree on that then. So he was warming up, called me by my first name, so we were getting on famously. <laughs> and then I said, I think you're an ontological reductionist. That you believe ontos, Greek being, you believe everything can be reduced to physics and chemistry. He said, that's right. That's my basic principle. So I said, let's have an experiment then. He said, what? Here at the table? I said, sure. So I picked up the menu. And he looked at it, and it wasn't very interesting. It said roast chicken, and not even in French, in English. And uh, <laughs> I, 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 he said, what's the problem? I said, you're a reductionist. Everything in terms of physics and chemistry. I said, now look at this thing here, R, O. I said, those are marks, aren't they? But they're semiotic, Greek semion, a sign. They're marks that carry meaning. He said, that's right. OK, I said. Explain to me the semiotics of those marks in terms of the physics and chemistry of the paper and ink. And there was a silence. And then his wife said a bit loudly, get out of that if you can. <laughs> but he didn't try. I want to tell you what he said. Now, this is one of the world's top biochemists. He said, John, for 40 years I've gone into my laboratory thinking that that could be done. But it can't. I was so amazed, I backtracked. And I said, oh, but science has only been going 500 years or so. I said, doesn't matter. You cannot explain the semiotics bottom up. You have to introduce an intelligence. And then it dawned on him that I wasn't bright enough to have thought of the argument. He said, where did you get that argument? <laughs> I said, I borrowed it from a Nobel Prize winner. <laughs> and I'm glad you laughed, ladies and gentlemen. It's interesting, isn't it? Just a few marks, and you instantly argue upwards and postulate mind. And we sit and look at the human genome. 3.7, is it, billion letters in exactly the right order in a four-letter chemical alphabet? 
sophisticated because the levels of information are contained not only in the linear sequencing but in the folding and in its relationship to the cell and all kinds of things. And we ask about its ultimate origin, chance and necessity. What? Chance and the laws of nature. We don't say that about print. What's the difference? Semiotics in both cases. Seems to me something very interesting is going on. And that semion, the evidence of meaning, our capacity. Because you see, ladies and gentlemen, we are not only containers of text, we are producers of text. And that, to my mind, is great evidence that there is a transcendence beyond nature. The beginnings of supernature are already to be seen within you. But now we must come finally uh, to the question of miracles. Because David Hume famously thought that miracles are by definition violations of natural law, and natural laws are unalterably uniform, therefore they cannot occur. And uh, Richard Dawkins is quite quick to say that the 19th century is the last time when it was possible for an educated person to admit to believing in miracles. Well, it's not quite that simple, because the aforementioned Nobel Prize winner William Phillips believes that the resurrection of Jesus literally happened, as does a friend of mine who is a vice president of the Royal Society and a biologist, to name just two. It can't be that simple. Now, in order to focus this, because we could spend a whole evening on it, I'm going to concentrate on the central claim of Christianity, and that is that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And I want to approach two questions. The one will be slightly longer than the other. The second would take a whole evening on its own. The question of the possibility of miracle as distinct from the actuality of miracle. C.S. Lewis reminds us that the first fact in the history of Christendom is a number of people who say they've seen the resurrection. If they died without making anyone else believe this gospel, no gospels would ever have been written. Now, let's remind ourselves of the contemporary perspective of science. Since scientific laws embody cause-effect relationships, scientists nowadays do not regard them as merely capable of describing what has happened in the past, provided we're not working at the quantum level, such laws can successfully predict what will happen in the future with such accuracy that even Newton law, Newton's laws will land somebody on the moon. And it's very natural that such scientists resent the idea that some god could arbitrarily intervene and alter, suspend, reverse, or otherwise violate these laws of nature, to quote David Hume. To them, that would seem to contradict the immutability of the laws and thus overturn the very basis of the scientific understanding of the universe. Now, David Hume is a problem child because, unfortunately, he didn't believe in cause and effect, which is the foundation of scientific laws. And secondly, he thought, quite correctly, that you couldn't prove induction, which is also the foundation of many of our scientific laws. And just before he died, I had opportunity to talk to Anthony Flew, who used to be Richard Dawkins of another age, and was the world's authority on David Hume. And he told me quite straight, he said, I was wrong about Hume. All my books would have to be rewritten because Hume did not actually believe in cause and effect and his arguments against miracles fail. Unfortunately, Anthony Flew did not live to write that book. Now let's look at some of these objections very quickly. The first is that belief in miracles in general and in the New Testament miracles in particular arose in a primitive pre-scientific culture where people were ignorant of the laws of nature. That's nonsense, of course, because a moment's thought shows us that in order to recognize some event as a miracle, they must know a corresponding regularity to which that event is an apparent exception. If you don't know that people who die normally stay in their graves, you'll not be surprised at a resurrection. <laughs> and, of course, that was appreciated long ago. Joseph, for instance, who was espoused to Mary, 
knew exactly where babies came from. <laughs> and so when Mary said she was pregnant, he wanted to divorce her. He wasn't ignorant of the laws of nature. And so his reason for later accepting her and the child that was conceived of the Holy Spirit, God becoming incarnate, must have been enormously powerful. It is simple nonsense to say that people did not know the laws of nature in those days. In fact, there was a uniform attitude against resurrection. When the Apostle Paul preached to the, uh, the philosophers at Athens and talked about Anastasis, Jesus rising from the dead, Anastasis, to stand up again, they laughed. They would not have laughed if he'd have been simply asserting the survival of some soul. They laughed because he was asserting something none of them believed in, and that is the physical and bodily resurrection. Now, the second objection is that now that we know the laws of nature, miracles are impossible. But that involves a further fallacy. Suppose I put $1,000 tonight in my hotel room in Cambridge, and I put $1,000 in tomorrow night. One plus one equals two, that's $2,000. And on the third day, I open the drawer, and I find $500. Now, what do I say? Do I say the laws of arithmetic have been broken or the laws of the United States have been broken? <laughs> well, you obviously got the point. But see how important it is. First of all, it's telling you that law means a different thing in both cases, in each case. Secondly, how do you know the laws of the United States have been broken? It's because you know the law of arithmetic. If you didn't know that, you wouldn't know the other. Now, you see, it's not the laws of arithmetic have been broken, but what they tell you is that somebody has put their hand into the drawer. That is, something has come in from outside the system because it wasn't a closed system. This is crucial. You see, I believe in the laws of nature. Indeed, God, who's responsible for them, created an orderly universe. Otherwise, as I said before, we'd never recognize an exception. But God is not a prisoner of the laws. They're not like the laws of the United States. God, who set the regularities there, can himself cause an event. Of course he can. What's to stop him doing that? You see... What Christians are claiming about the resurrection of Jesus is not that he rose by some natural processes. No, they say that he rose because God injected enormous power and energy from outside the system. Now, unless you have evidence that the system is totally causally closed, you cannot argue against the possibility of miracles. So now you have to come, and that was far too brief, but I want to give you plenty of time for questions. Now we need to come to the actuality. Is there evidence anywhere that a miracle of this order has occurred? And of course, as you know, Christianity is based on the claim that Jesus Christ came alive from the dead. How do you get at a thing like that? Of course it's a singularity. Of course it is highly improbable. Observations of all the graves, if you were to take people from Harvard and set them in the graveyards to watch for a month and write in their book whether they saw a resurrection or not, <laughs> you could scientifically show by statistical methods that resurrections are very improbable in the Harvard area. But unless you've investigated every grave back to the beginning of the universe, you cannot say they're impossible. Singular events are by definition improbable. But the question is, is there actual evidence that it happened? The claim is it did. What are the facts? There is an empty tomb. How do we know? And then I would have to take you into the specifics of the evidence. And unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, although I'd absolutely love to do that, I'd have to come back to do it, but I've got a little bit of a stop in that direction. This question, I'm so glad that you asked me this question because I find it all over the world the same. 
because it's vastly important to realize that this is not knocking science in any sense. It's recognizing the limits of science. So what I decided to do was this. I decided to read through David Hume in great detail, look at his criteria for evidence and witnesses, and then take the resurrection of Jesus and put it under the magnifying glass from the perspective of David Hume. And here's another shameless bit of advertising. I've just produced a book on it, <laughs> which is called Gunning for God. And it deals with that question. And I hope that those of you who want to pursue it that far will be able to read it. Now, my final point is this. Of course, science and history are not the only sources of evidence for the existence of God, miracle, and the supernatural. Personal experience is enormously important. And it's even important to a professor who's interested in intellectual things. Because one of the prime evidences to me that these things are real is my personal experience over many years of the living reality of Christ in my life. If he's risen from the dead, of course, it means he's alive, and that opens up the enormous possibility of having a relationship with him. So that, too, would be a very important thing to explore. I started by reminding you of Harvard's motto, Veritas. But you know, that's not what it used to be. And I was delighted to see it's still on one of your main buildings. Harvard's motto was, and still is, Veritas Christo et Ecclesiae, Truth for Christ and the Church. I would suggest to you, Harvard students and professors, the time has come to revisit the original meaning. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. While you collect your questions and hand them towards the aisle, I have a few uh, questions myself for uh, Professor Lennox. One more personal, since he concluded on a personal note, and then a few to have him help us think through the implications of belief in supernatural and miracles for academic study and research. Um, so first, though, could you tell us a little bit more about your background and upbringing and what have got you interested in these questions of the supernatural God and, and their relation to science. Well, as I said, I, I come from Ireland, which has a pretty rotten reputation for religion. And I was very fortunate to have parents who were Christian and not sectarian, and who loved me a lot, a, enough to allow me to think. And what I mean by that is this. I remember my father saying to me when I was about 13, have you ever read Marx? And I said, no. Well, he said, I think you'd better. And he handed me the Communist Manifesto. <laughs> and that habit of thought in our home, he was not an educated man. He'd love to have had an education. I was the first to get to university, and I got to Cambridge, and I was very fortunate. But that habit lived with me. Now, when this student challenged me about my Irishness, and of course you believe in God, and it's all genetics, I'd heard that many times, but I thought, you know, I've thought about a lot of arguments, I've read a lot, but I want to really get to know people because we don't all start in the same position. And Singer, you see, my big objection to religion is people end up where they started. Well, of course, Singer, and I talked to him about it afterwards, doesn't seem to have a lot of experience of people changing their worldview. But what I discovered at Cambridge in England was that by considering evidence, people who started from non-religious presuppositions, from atheism or agnosticism, 
could come to faith and could see their lives transformed. And that was a very powerful bit of evidence for me because i be honest with you, ladies and gentlemen, I do not know what it is like to be an adult and not believe in God. So I suppose that set me on a path and particularly going to Eastern Europe where I met uh, in, the, in Eastern Germany particularly, I met many people who'd been systematically exposed to atheistic philosophy in their schools and education. And I spent most of my life exposing my faith to its opposite. Why? Because I'm actually interested in veritas. I'm not interested in religion as a sort of uh, comfort prop and you know, a, a wish fulfillment kind of thing a la, a la Sigmund Freud. I want to know whether it is true or not. And I would just say that I've, I've profited from many mentors. Cambridge was a, a wonderful institution, and Oxford is nearly as good. Um, <laughs> and I've been fortunate in life to be able to have these interactions at a very high level, and recently to do these debates. Now, you might want to precise that a bit, you know. I'm, I'm waffly a bit. Well, no, would you I want think... to come down to anything more precise than that? I think that will, will suffice for now since our time is somewhat limited. And I would like to move on to these questions of um, how does some of what you were saying about belief systems and the possibility of, of uh, the supernatural relate to our actual day-to-day -day work, say, as uh, academics. It seems like a lot of academic work proceeds under what uh, might be called assumption of methodologic naturalism that um, even if we believe in the supernatural, we often set those beliefs aside for the purposes of academic study and research that supposedly uh, leads to more common ground and a common method for study and allows for consensus amongst those with very different uh, beliefs. So how would a general belief in the supernatural and allowing that come into academic work change the way things are done? And should that, should that happen? Well, it doesn't change the way Mine? Hello. <laughs> Hello. Just speak a little louder. <laughs> Let's have a go at putting this up. Um, I've, uh, the term methodological naturalism I don't find particularly helpful. Uh, reading Richard Dawkins, The Blind Watchmaker, you know, where he talks about uh, it's terribly tempting to think it's designed, but it's only been apparently designed. Now, just taking that example, it seems to me for 99.99% of science, it makes no difference whether you think it's apparently designed or actually designed. So methodological theism would work as well as methodological naturalism. The problem comes here with what I would call the truth quest. Could it be that there are times where philosophical presuppositions affect the science? Now, in 99.9% .9 of cases, they don't, because sciences are, scientists are studying how it works, what are the equations governing this diffusion, and so on, what are the statistics of the latest epidemic, and so on, in your work. Uh, we're not concerned with those questions, but now comes the big question. Could it be that studying a system under, if you like, naturalistic presuppositions raises questions that are insolvable at that level, where we must look to a higher level of the input of mind. Now, that's where the real problem comes. Now, if you take Richard Lewinton of, I believe he's here, isn't he? Um, or was here, a very distinguished geneticist. He said, look, Science doesn't force us into methodological naturalism. It is our a priori conviction of naturalism that forces us to look for a purely naturalistic solution, and I'm quoting now, however contrary to intuition and however counterintuitive, and then he was very honest. He said, we must not let a divine foot into the door. Now, I can precise that. When we're studying the question of genetic information, it is perfectly legitimate to work out all the pathways, all the possibilities, and so on. But it raises the specter of this question. Can we account for it exhaustively bottom-up, or 
Because it has a semiotic dimension, do we need to allow the influence of mind? And I suggest our lack of progress in a way with the origin of life uh, question may um, lead to that. And that's the topic on which I've written one or two things. So that's what I would say. Let's watch, are we narrowing science down? Uh, Anthony Flew, I mentioned before, who was a great atheist and who converted to deism late in life, and he was asked, why did you become a deist? Why do you believe in an intelligent creator, at least at the beginning? And he really shocked Richard Dawkins because he said, because of DNA. Because I see in that evidence of intelligent input. So what he was doing was looking at the facts that have been discovered either by methodological naturalistic methods or whatever, and saying, but the implications of what we've discovered at that level transcend, they break through a barrier above. And all I'm saying is, I want to be able to follow the evidence where it leads. I don't want to have my evidence and my conclusions forced into a naturalistic paradigm, because it seems to me that's closing down science rather than opening it up. So following up on that, I'd like to focus in briefly on a uh, short case study from uh, my own field. You talked about how miracles are often taken to be violations of the uh, laws of nature, and I'm wondering to what extent is the miraculous then really open to scientific inquiry and scientific uh, methods in, within uh, medicine and public health. Believe it or not, there are uh, randomized trials to look at whether prayer is effective or not. Um, and um, some of these studies have found an effect, uh, others have not. And there have been meta-analyses looking at this question. One published in a prestigious medical journal suggested there was an effect. Another one published by a very reputable um, group that focuses on meta-analyses suggested that there wasn't. Is this sort of thing reasonable to do? Should we uh, look at these questions with regard to the miraculous, to the supernatural, using the methods of science? Or should this be left to uh, theologians, to philosophers, or to um, discussions on a Friday evening? Just um, one second while Professor Lennox is, is answering that question. Could the students who are reading the questions from students please come in to the microphones to ask those questions? And this will be our moderator's last question. Thank you. Well, I'll have to give a short answer. He's asking really interesting questions to my mind. I think we should apply the methodology appropriate to the claim. And if the claim is that a certain thing happened, let's take the resurrection as a fact of history, what are the appropriate methods? Well, of course, it's a singularity, and it's highly improbable. And it leads us into a realm of science that often is not carefully defined enough. What I mean by that is this. Normally, when we think of science, we think of inductive methods. We do an experiment 100 times, we get the same result, and we expect that to happen the 101st time. Well, you can't repeat a resurrection to see if it happened or not. And what we therefore have to employ are the methods of forensic science. The body of John Lennox lies on the floor, he's dead. You can't say, well, let's rerun the experiment to see what happened. <laughs> but you can get at it by methods that we might generously call historical science. I would certainly call them that because the natural sciences have got those two branches. The whole history of the universe only happened once. And cosmologists are constantly investigating singularities by these kinds of methods. So the methods are more appropriate to the historian. Now, because they're a priori higher, highly improbable, I think Francis Collins, the director of the National Institute of Health, whom, as you probably know, was an atheist, became a Christian, he's got a very good warning. He said, we mustn't rush into the miraculous too quickly and believe in it all over the place. Otherwise, we will completely obscure those things that are genuinely of that character. And I would agree with him very much. But I do think, and that's what I've tried to do, uh, we can approach them by those methods. Now, to come directly to your question, I'm actually interested in those meta-analyses, and I think we need to discuss this in a little bit more detail, because I've just been reading a book by the uh, former president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, Andrew Sims, and he's responding to Dawkins' notion that religion has zero benefits. And he quotes a, a distinguished meta-analysis. This is Andrew Sims in a book that's just come out. 
and I'm not an epidemiologist like you, but what he suggests is this, that the vast volume of literature shows that religious belief has a beneficial effect. And he adds this. He said, if the findings had gone in the opposite direction, it would be front page news in every newspaper in the world. But it's actually one of psychiatry's best kept secrets. Now, I, I, I don't know. I've just read his book recently, and I'm impressed by it. I, I assume he's done his work. So it seems to me there is a benefit. I am highly skeptical, though, about testing and saying, well, you pray for the chap and you don't. <laughs> and let's see what happens. I, I think that... <laughs> Done. <laughs> yes, I know, but I'm very skeptical of the results. What I'm not skeptical of is my own experience of answers to prayer and guidance in life. But of course, you can write those off as subjective experiences. So I'll have to leave it there, I'm afraid. Well, thank you very much for uh, your responses. And I think we're going to turn over to the questions from uh, all of you now. And what I'm going to do, ladies and gentlemen, just to explain, we want you to hear a few questions before I answer any of them. So I'm going to write them down, and then we look at a few together. So go ahead. Great. So, uh, of course, we want to thank everyone who sent in their questions, either via Twitter or via text message. And so here are our first five that we've chosen. How do you approach people who simply don't care, who neither believe nor do not believe? OK. How do I approach people who don't care? With caution. Next question. <laughs> Keep going. All right, the, the next question. Do you believe there are examples of God's supernatural intervention today? And have there been any in your life? Uh, the third question. If I were to tell you I was just resurrected from the dead, what evidence would you require to believe it? Uh, question four, yeah. you claim that science and religion do not make exclusive truth claims. Various world religions, however, do make exclusive truth claims. How can we know that Christianity is right at the exclusion of others? And okay. the fifth question, um, in light of your claim that God is not a prisoner of his own laws, please clarify your Henry Ford analogy. Henry Ford, of course, is a prisoner of the laws of the universe. How then does he compare to a god which you claim is outside of the universe's mechanisms? Thank you very much. Well, that's very interesting. You've all heard the questions, and I'll now have a go at them. And you're now about to experience the limits of my ignorance. <laughs> because this is a Q&A, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to do my best. What I'm going to do is there are very good questions. I'm going to suggest uh, an approach to them for you to think about. And that's as much as we can do in this kind of thing. But let's have a look at the first one. How do I approach people who don't care? I try to care for them. That's what I try to do. If people don't care, there's usually a reason. And it often is a very complex psychological reason. I'm very fortunate to have two loving parents. Some people have none. And the idea of a God who loves them is just foreign. It means nothing to them. And so it seems to me that people who don't care, they are saying something about themselves that goes very deep. And I would like to find out a little bit more of why they don't care, provided I don't intrude too far into their private space. Because it seems to me that God is extremely interested in people who don't care. Because they often have very good reasons for not caring. So I would begin to explore that. And uh, treat people, you know, I was taught very early on that every person is of infinite value. I look out at you, I really do believe that every one of you is of infinite value, made in the image of God. You're more important than the sun. You know it's there, it doesn't know you're there. <laughs> you realize that, don't you? <laughs> and so it seems to me that when we get these 
I don't care. Because if you look at that statement, from standing back from it, if there is a, a God who really is ultimately behind you, and he cares for you, and you don't care about him, there's a disjoint somewhere. And I would want, naturally, to try very gently to find out exactly what's going on. And of course, it's often because people have had a very negative experience of religion, of Christian religion, alas, sometimes. So that's how I would approach that. Now, if I were to tell, I'm not going to answer these in the order in which you uh, asked them. I'm going to have a, a slightly more logical order, I hope. Um, if I were to tell you that I was just resurrected, well, I would want evidence that you died. <laughs> but I'd want more. I'd want evidence that you were buried. And actually, that raises a very interesting question. Because when we come to study historiographically the resurrection of Jesus, the fact that he died and it's historically attested, and was buried, and it's historically attested, is part of the thing. So when you show me you died, then I'll take your claim seriously. <laughs> now, Henry Ford is a prisoner of the laws of the universe. I'm not sure that's correct. We are beings, and of course our existence is parametrized by the laws of physics. We live consistently with them. But I do feel, ladies and gentlemen, again, naturalism tends to lead to determinism. And that tends to lead to the fact that thought is meaningless. And dialogue is meaningless because, of course, it's simply been pre-programmed in the genes of the atoms of the universe. But I don't believe the universe is a closed system. And just as I believe that there is a creator God, who has made each of us in his image, I believe he has made us, at least in part, to be creative. In fact, I think that's why many of you are at this university. You're developing your creative potential. You want to do something new. And that is a marvelous thing. But of course, that wasn't the point of the analogy at all. Uh, analogies are dangerous things because they lead to ask, people asking all kinds of questions that have nothing to do with the point for which the analogy was intended. <laughs> the point of the analogy is this, that in the construction of the motor car, two separate things are involved. It was originated in the mind of Henry Ford. It involves <coughs> physics, chemistry, engineering, and the laws of internal combustion. Talking about Henry Ford as an explanation, if you use that word explanation, you do not mean the same by that as when you say the laws of internal combustion are an explanation. That's all I'm saying. I'm saying what you read in any book of the philosophical analysis of the nature of explanation, that there are several, in fact many, different categories of explanation. And unfortunately, many of the new atheists are not philosophers, and they collapse them into one. Now, are there examples of God's intervention today and in my own life? Now, that's a very personal question. And there's always the danger in attempting to answer this of rationalization. What will convince one pe person will not convince another. And that is why I feel we need enormous evidence for the question of the intervention of God. I believe in the resurrection because I think we have got that enormous evidence at the objective historical side, if history is never completely objective, of course, but as contrasted with the evidence of my subjective experience. But in my life, I have a wife. We've been married 43 years. I've got three children, and I've got five grandchildren. We pray together. We discuss scripture together. I couldn't begin to enumerate to you the times when things have happened in life, which you could attribute to coincidence, if you wished, 
but where the improbability grows vast. Would you like me to tell you about one of them? Yes. I very rarely do this. <laughs> but I will, because, as you know, I have been a lot to Russia. How did I come to go to Russia? Well, I'll tell you. I was at a conference of mathematical cryptographers. <laughs> but, uh, you all depend on them, so don't laugh. <laughs> If you ever use an ATM, you've got a mathematical cryptographer right inside the box collecting the money. Um, <laughs> and it was in Belgium, and we finished the conference, and the bus driver lost his way to the station, and we missed the train. So there were 50 very angry mathematicians standing on <laughs> the platform in Belgium. And in the end, we got on the train, and I was going to Cologne, and it was late at night, and I was a bit concerned. I had a heavy suitcase, and in those days, Cologne Station wasn't the best place to be found after midnight. So I found myself in a compartment with a German, a Belgian, and two Russians. And I sat beside the Russian, and I started to talk to him, and he was rather surprised that I could speak a bit of his language. And I said, what do you do? And he said, I'm an ecologist. Oh, I said, the ecologist? Do they have those in Russia? <laughs> and he said, yes, and this is the first time I've been out in the West. I come from Lake Baikal. So I said, can you openly talk about ecology in Russia? He said, well, you know, we can say a bit. And then I said to him, are there other things that you can talk about openly that were taboo earlier? He said, like what? I said, like God, for example. And he said, yes, we can talk about God. In that moment, the thought came into my head, I've got to give this man a Bible. It's a curious thought to get in a train going through Belgium in the middle of the night. And I kept talking to him. I couldn't get it out of my head. And in the end, the thought grew so strong I thought, this is crazy. I mean, where do you get a Bible from in the middle of the night in a train going through Belgium? And then I had another thought. I thought, I wonder if it's still there. Three weeks before that, I'd been in Germany with a publisher. Sitting on his desk was a Russian Bible. And I said, that's a nice Bible. He said, do you want it? I can't read it. I said, I love it. Mine is pretty old, and I like that. So I put it in my suitcase. I wonder, is it still there? So while I was still talking to this chap, I got up put my hand into the suitcase, and the Bible was still there. So I brought it out, and I handed it to him. He went as white as a sheet. He couldn't speak. And I thought he was going to have a heart attack. <laughs> I said, what's wrong with you? He said, nothing. And then he said, kak vi uznali eta. How did you know this? I said, what do you mean, how did I know this? He said, how did you know that six weeks ago the only Bible we've ever seen was stolen in Yerkutsk in Siberia? And we've just got an opportunity to come to the West. In four hours' time, we're taking the place, plane to Moscow. How did you know? I said, do you believe this book? He said, I don't know. But he said, look in the corner. That's my wife. She believes it. And I turned. I'll never forget it. To see this young woman with her face glowing, the tears streaming down her face as she clutched the Bible. And she said, is that really for me? Are you really giving it to me? I said, of course. And they were gone in the night. And the German girl said to me, she said, does that often happen to you? <laughs> I said, you shouldn't think it's strange. She said, why not? Well, I said, look, this person comes from a country where they've been systematically denied access to this book. If this really is the word of God, he could use me as a postman as much as anybody else. Well, then she said, I'd better read it. So she did. And we carried on a correspondence. Now, what do you make of a story like? To me, I got home, told my wife. She said, let me see your diary. She did something she's never done in her life before, or since. 
She said, clear your diary for at least two months. I said, pardon? She said, you're going to Russia. I said, She said, how would you go to Russia? Well, I said, it's a very complicated business. You've got to ring the Royal Society, fill in endless forms and so on. She said, ring them. Well, I said, perhaps next week, right now. So Muggins does what he's told. <laughs> and the man at the end says, Professor Lennox, you want to go to Russia? When can you go? How long can you go for? Um, we want the Russian mathematicians out. It's a week for a week. Can you go for a month? I said, my wife says two. He said, done, no forms. You get the money, you can leave tomorrow if you want. <laughs> when I got to Russia, ladies and gentlemen, the middle of the Academy of Sciences, all they wanted to know was, how could a person like me believe in God? I can't tell you what flowed from that. But I firmly believe it was an intervention of God. But I expect these things to happen all the time because God is real. But I leave that story at that and come to the last question, and it's this. Science and religion, but there are different religions. Now, this is an immensely important question because leaving Christianity outside altogether, religions do not agree with each other. It's idle to pretend that they do. Science is an international discipline. And of course, we are all aware of the sad fightings, even within Christendom, in my own country of Northern Ireland. So I've got a lot to answer for, in a way. And how do I approach this question? Well, in exactly the same way as everything else. I find, let's take the three great monotheistic religions. I have many Muslim friends and Jewish friends in many parts of the world. And when it comes to the resurrection of Jesus, there are three different views, as you know. The Jews believe, my Jewish friends believe, that Jesus died and did not rise. My Muslim friends believe he didn't die. And I believe that he both died and rose. They cannot all be true. How do you approach a question like that? Well, first of all, I step completely back from it. And I realize that there are two levels of difference between religion. <coughs> and the first thing to recognize, ladies and gentlemen, as you go around the world, study all religions or none, people of any faith, philosophy you care to name, you'll find a striking fact. And it's that there's a common element of morality that's shared by almost every living human being. I've done a bit of research on this. And you will find the golden rule, do unto others as you would be done by, in every single religion, in every single philosophy, even Roman pagan philosophy, and in the fundamental statement of British humanism. You will find it everywhere. What does that tell me? It tells me that we need to respect each other's ethical code. Sometimes as a Christian, I can be put to shame by the moral integrity of someone of another religion. And therefore, we approach this with great sensitivity. So that's the first thing. But what I notice is this, ladies and gentlemen, that the real difference comes not at the level of ethics and morality, so much as at the level of the basis on which a person can have a relationship with God. And there, religions and philosophies divide into two systems. One of the systems is a bit like Harvard University. There is an entrance examination. I presume you have an entrance, do you? Or do you just get in without an exam? No. You don't. So there's an entrance exam. So we can imagine that as a door here. And then there's the Harvard way. And it goes up and down. And you try and stay on it. And there are all the professors to teach you. And then there's a whacking great gate at the end. It's called final exams. Now. The whole principle on which the system depends is that of merit. The professors, all of them, are infinitely kind. And, uh, but, I hope they are anyway. <laughs> but they cannot guarantee that you're going to get through the door at the end, can you? 
It depends on merit. Your performance. Your achievement. And many religions are like that. And their adherents tell me they're like that. There's some initiation right. You get on the way. You try to follow the way. And you hope that then when the great assessment comes and your good deeds are measured against your bad deeds, that somehow the good ones will weigh more than the bad ones and you will be accepted into whatever is beyond. I know that's a slight caricature, but it's what many people believe. It's what many Christians actually believe. Now, I do not believe that at all. Because, ladies and gentlemen, the unique thing, it seems to me, about Christian faith is it's not based on merit. Because it does have a gate in a way. But at the beginning, there stands Jesus Christ, who claims to have come into the world to die for my sin. Now, that's a very ugly word to raise in Harvard, but you did ask me about religions. So I'll have to give you the answer that I believe is the true one. In other words, let me put it this way. Suppose I did my first day at Cambridge, I saw a beautiful girl. I married her eventually. <laughs> I suppose I went to her and said, Sally, do you know, I'd like to marry you, but here's a cookbook. Now, it's got a whole lot of rules inside it. Now, if you keep those rules fairly well for the next 30 or 40 years, I will think about accepting you. Of course, I couldn't possibly accept you now. But if you perform well enough, when the final assessment comes, I will accept you. Well, some of you are laughing. Others of you might be experiencing that. I don't know. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you see, that would be to insult her. The secret of my marriage, ladies and gentlemen, is this. That we accepted each other at the beginning. Unconditionally. And because she doesn't have to keep the rules of the cookbook, so to speak, in order to gain my acceptance. That sets her free to learn to cook. And it's exactly the same with God. We wouldn't dream of basing our relationship with a fellow human being on a measured performance and an acceptance at the end of a long history of performing laws. And yet millions of people think that that's the way to base a relationship with God. And it seems to me here, and let me say it straight, Christianity competes with no other religion here. Because as far as I can see, Christ is the only person that offers me the knowledge of forgiveness right here and now. So in my life, I try to live for him, not in order to gain his acceptance, but because, ladies and gentlemen, I already have it. It's not based on my performance or my merit. It's based on the merit of Jesus Christ, who died and rose for me. And there, ladies and gentlemen, I think we'll have to leave it. Thank you for your patience. Thank you so much, Dr. Lennox, for this wonderful presentation. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.